She'll be walking here shortly uh, if her team doesn't change her dissertation one more time. <laughs> uh, she is the director, and she has an incredible staff at the center. Uh, and what they do, if you don't know, they give oversight to over 500 independent school districts, to law enforcement, to the entire uh, junior college system throughout the state of Texas. That's where you go when you don't know enough to ask the question, when you don't have the resources to evaluate and to do your job. This is the agency and these are the people. This is where the governor looks when he has new mandates. This is where TEA says we need somebody to team with that has the resources. And what I love to say about Dr. Joe is uh, the research aspect of this organization is second to none. If they tell you to go left, and not right, it's been because there's been extensive research and that's a best practice. Not only through the audit system are they helping school districts be able to focus on what the issues are, how to be better, but to report those things, not for punitive measures, but so that they can meet some minimum standards and so that they can develop some best practices. Uh, folks, it's, it's an understatement to say we're at, we're at war right now with our students and the safety of our students. There is no better team. There is no better agency. There is no better bang for the buck that we get than when the Texas School Safety Center. And the two people that we have here today, uh, they're gonna hate me for saying this. They may not have every answer to your question, but they've been able to answer every one of my questions to my satisfaction. And so would you help me in giving a warm welcome for our first time visitors to Nacogdoches, the SFA and the Lone Star Legislative Conference, Kathy martinez Prather and Dr. Joe McKenna. Well, wow, that was a great introduction. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> um, as Paul said, I'm Kathy martinez Prather and I'm the director of the Texas School Safety Center, and we're located at Texas State University in San Marcos. And I have my colleague here with me, uh, Dr. Kenna, who is over our research and education division at the center. So we're really excited to have the opportunity to, to be here this morning to come and talk to you um, and tell you about our role in school safety across the state and um, best practices towards achieving a comprehensive school safety initiative. But before I start, I was just kind of curious, how many um, school administrators do we have in the room? Okay, how many teachers? Do we have any teachers? Do we have any school-based law enforcement? Okay, um, how many of you are parents of students in school right now? Okay. Well, I wanna thank all of you for the work that you're doing in making school safety a part of the educational agenda, and your presence here today is very indicative of your 
of your um, concern and your passion towards, towards that issue. So just a little bit about the center. We were actually created in 1999. And to give you a little bit of context about that, um, we were created shortly after the Columbine uh, High School school shootings. Um, we were authorized um, by the 77th Texas Legislature. In 2001, we were written into the Texas Education Code to exist. And we are one of five university-level research centers at Texas State University. And our authorities, as I said, were written under Chapter 37 of the Texas Education Code with the charge of serving as the central clearinghouse for school safety in the state to provide training, research, and technical assistance. And we're also written into the governor's Homeland Security Strategic Plan to advance school safety across the state. So who do we serve? Well, we have about 1,025 school districts that serve about over 9,000 campuses that also serve over 5.1 million students. And then we have 50 community colleges um, that have over 70 campuses that serve over 700,000 students. But charter schools and private schools also utilize our resources as well and attend a lot of our trainings. So we have a wide um, uh, scope of impact here, as you can see. Our mission at the Texas School Safety Center is to um, serve schools and communities uh, to create safe, secure, and healthy environments. And we take that responsibility very seriously. And as you can see, um, there's a lot at stake, and there are a lot of folks that are impacted by school safety issues every single day. And so when we think about school safety, especially um, in the current climate that we're in, our minds tend to go to the worst possible case scenario, which are mass acts of violence. And that's understandable. But when I talk about school safety, school safety is really an umbrella for a lot of issues that schools deal with every single day. And still, schools remain one of the safest places that we can send our children every single day. And so all that to say, we should never become complacent in our efforts. And so I think that Texas, compared to other states across the nation, has really been um, a leader and, and a model in making school safety a part of, a part of the educational agenda. Um, and ensuring that schools have certain compliance measures in place um, to make sure that they have best practices to have a comprehensive school safety program. And so at the Texas School Safety Center, we focus on all aspects of school safety. And that goes to teaching schools to know how to prevent, mitigate, prepare, respond to, and certainly recover from any type of hazard that could happen on their campus, whether it's man-made or it's a natural disaster, as we've seen impacted our districts here in Texas just last year. And so today we want to share with you a little bit about um, what the Texas School Safety Center is doing in terms of the best practices that we teach schools on, uh, and some of the components that we work with them on towards developing a comprehensive school safety program. And I will hand it over to Jim. Thank you. Oh, Can you push? Oh. <laughs> um, so as Kathy mentioned, the approach we take to school safety is um, is a comprehensive one, and as Kathy also mentioned, the legislature over the years has done a good job of putting into the education code certain requirements of, of school districts to make sure that we are prepared um, to respond to and also recover from different types of hazards and threats. And so one of those um, key pieces of legislation is that every school district in the state uh, is required to have a multi-hazard emergency operations plan. And what that means is schools are to take a comprehensive approach to make sure that they are ready, um, that they prepare for, we'll talk a little bit about how schools can prepare for and train, um, but also um, have the response capability as well as recover from. And so one of the things that we do at the center is the, the legislation is to have this plan in place. Well, we get into the quality of that plan. Having a plan and having a quality plan are two different things. And so we focus on these key planning principles, and there are, there are six of them that I'll, I'll go over here um, briefly. The first one is supported by leadership. The second one is, is a, a collaborative process, and I'll talk about each one of these here in a minute. Um, you have to consider all settings and times, right? These disasters, these emergencies, they don't happen at the most convenient times, um, when everyone's in class, when everything is, is, is smooth. Um, so we have to consider all, type, uh, all different settings and times. It has to provide for the whole, the whole school community. Um, not every student is the same. Not every student is going to be able to be evacuated in the same way. 
Um, so you have to consider uh, all the different nuances that a school district may have to encounter when responding to a, uh, any type of emergency. We take an all hazards approach uh, in Texas, which is um, which is a, is a best practice. So rather than having school districts prepare for every little type of um, emergency that they may have to respond to, we take an all hazards approach and we look for uh, response actions and we practice those response actions that are suitable for a number of different hazards. So you can evacuate for a number of different hazards if the threat is in the building and you need to get out. It's not just for a fire, but if anything were to happen in the building, evacuate is the appropriate response. Um, and we build, we build these plans on assessments and data. Um, it should be data driven, they shouldn't be um, you know, based on simply a conversation or a thought. They should be driven by local hazards, local data um, that you can use to build these plans. So first one is being supported by leadership. Uh, it's critical that you have buy-in from top down, um, that you see um, the superintendent engaged, that you see um, other leadership of the school engaged in this emergency management, engaged in this safety process. Um, one of the things that's also in the education code here in Texas is that every district is required to have a safety and security committee. It's chapter 37, 109. Um, that committee should be involved in this process throughout. They should be the body for the school district that, that is engaged in this process. Um, and it's important when, when we see buy-in from the top, uh, not only at the district level, but at the campus level, we know our teachers, we know our educators, we know our support staff and our students are going to buy into um, how critical um, the emergency operations plan is for, for the district. I mentioned using uh, assessments to customize. <coughs> Another piece of legislation that exists in Texas is that school districts are required to conduct safety and security audits of their facilities. We should use that data, as, as Paul mentioned, um, this is not, the, the audit process is not, uh, let's just measure compliance and be punitive. Uh, it's let's identify gaps that we have now um, and address them before those gaps um, become vulnerabilities in, in a situation. So school districts should be looking at this as a very secular, circular kind of process where we identify gaps, we address them, we assess again, and we use that data in the plan. Um, another important piece when we assess is capability. You need to know um, if you're writing into your plan that law enforcement's coming and they're going to bring X amount of officers and, and equipment, better make sure that your community has those type of resources. We want to make sure that we're building our plan on reality. What's coming? How fast is it coming? Uh, do we need an agreement with the neighboring school district? Do we need an agreement with uh, a community partner to be able to support the implementation of our plan? The all hazards approach is really key, um, and kind of this will probably be a theme in some of the, the information that we share later as well. Um, but it's got to consider a wide range of possibilities, and Texas is extremely diverse, right? And so, something that you plan for in West Texas, you're probably not going to prepare for a hurricane, um, right? So you need to consider um, what hazards your community is expected uh, could potentially encounter. And you look at those not only in terms of possibility. But in terms of impact, if this were to happen, so it may be a low probability, but a high impact. Uh, but it may be a high probability and a lower impact. So you want to consider um, those different um, possibilities for different hazards. Um, and you need to be able to understand if this disaster were to happen, what am I going to do before? What can I do before to prepare for that? What can I do during um, that incident? What am I going to have to do? Where am I going to move students to? Um, but also the recovery piece, and we sometimes forget that. How are we getting students back into school? These students need credit to graduate. Um, these students may need some sense of normalcy, depending on what the disaster is. Parents may need to address certain issues that, that they have in the community. So not forgetting about that recovery piece after, um, even, the, even a small scale disaster requires some degree of, of recovery. Um, and the last point I'll make here, but an all-hazards approach, and the first responders in the room will know, our move towards common language, uh, not using codes, code red, that, that doesn't exist anymore, in, as I'm sure the, long, uh, the first responders can mention in the room. Um, so we, we have some resources that I'm going to share later uh, where we move towards common language. Let's make sure that everyone understands when we call for a certain action, um, that everyone understands what that action is. The whole community, um, the educators in the room will know that 
you, you all di deal with very diverse student populations uh, in terms of uh, functional access needs, in terms of um, behavior, in terms of all of these things. These need to be considered. Um, there are populations of students that you may have to move that aren't moved like traditional students, right? If you have students in wheelchairs, if you have students um, who are, have uh, hearing impairments, how are we going to notify them? How are we going to be able to move them? How can we prepare for that? That's something we may have to practice several times in order to get it right. And, and this is key, and this is, I think, where we have been when we get into the conversation of you can have a plan, but when you start to move your plan uh, from a plan to a quality plan, um, when we do drills, when we do exercises, we all have done fire drills, right? And you do them, you kind of know you're sitting in your classroom, we get out, we walk out the door, and we go down the hall. Well, what if it happens during class change? What if it happens during lunch? What if it happens when people are out in the stadium, on the field, whatever it might be? Those situations also need to be considered um, because how you respond and how you prepare for that might be extremely different. Um, so starting to think outside the box, um, on off campus, a lot of you, I'm sure, who are from campuses know that your campus is probably used every single day of the week, right? Saturday and Sunday, there's some type of event there. Do those folks that are using your campus on the weekends know what to do? Uh, it's, a, it's your facility still. So um, if you have the opportunity to mitigate property damage, potential loss of life, depending on what the emergency <coughs> is, you want to make sure that you're considering um, the, the variety of different ways your facility can be used and the times it can be used. Um, you know, or the things going on after school, their after school programs, other extracurricular activities um, that also need to be considered in this planning process. And it really does need to be collaborative. Uh, I mentioned uh, agreements. I don't think anyone in this room would stand up and say that um, a school district can do this by themselves. Um, they are dependent upon community support, first responders, um, nonprofits, community <coughs> partners that have resources that the school district may not need all the time, but may need if a certain situation were to arise. Um, so having those conversations, having those formal agreements in place, um, having those conversations, sit with your first responders, discuss what to expect uh, if they were to arrive, involve them in drills, involve them in planning. Uh, it really is a, a community approach to safety. Those conversations need to happen uh, before something happens. You should be familiar um, on both sides, what, what the county, what the city can provide, as well as what the school district might be able um, to provide. And those different perspectives are going to make for a much more quality, high quality plan uh, because everyone is going to see safety from a different lens. A uh, first responder, an educator, um, you know, custodial staff, they're all going to see it from a different lens. They're going to have considerations um, that sometimes our narrow perspectives don't allow us to see. So we certainly encourage a very collaborative process. Use that safety and security committee. Uh, as well as other folks that are engaged in the community around school safety. So I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy uh, for a little bit to talk about how uh, these are the principles that we build our plan on. I'll turn it to Kathy to talk a little bit about what that actual plan looks like. So when we are out talking to schools about developing plans, um, one of the things that we stress <coughs> is that it's an ongoing process. You don't build your plan and then you get it approved and you're done. You're constantly reviewing, you're constantly updating, especially if you have an incident, so you're doing corrective action plans to make sure that you're addressing gaps that you've identified in your responses, any sort of things that you found to be weaknesses. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So we talk about, the first step is what we've talked about in terms of the planning principles is forming a collaborative planning team. And as school districts are required to have a school uh, safety and security committee um, that should be a part of this process. And we talk about, well, who should be involved in the planning process? It needs to be your campus district level administration. You want to have teachers. You want to have um, folks from the local community, first responders, because we school districts, we always say you should never work in silos. You can't do this by yourself. It's a whole community effort beyond just your school community. And I always say that plans are not built in a meeting. And they're not built in one day. This is a process. And so you have to dedicate and determine what is going to be your regular schedule for building these plans and putting them together to make sure that you're addressing all the hazards that are in your community and making sure that it's comprehensive and you're not just checking things off the list to say that you're getting them done. 
We talked about identifying threats and hazards and assessing risks. And um, we often get a lot of questions from schools, you know, how do we get this type of information? But a lot of this information um, you can get from your local or your county emergency management coordinators who are going to know when the last time a flash flood occurred, who are going to know when the last time a tornado hit your, your, your local community. And talking to your local law enforcement to kind of assess what is the, the crime activity within my, my local community and what are some of the threats, hazards, and vulnerabilities that we're exposed to that we have to consider when we're identifying all of our threats. And I always say you have to be realistic when you're identifying your threats. Um, uh, like Joe had mentioned, um, you want to make sure that you don't have a plan for a tsunami event if you're living in West Texas. That's probably never going to happen, okay? Um, and so you also want to assess risks. And um, whether it's a human cause, a technological, or a natural hazard. And so at the Texas School Safety Center, we work on developing um, online training toolkits for our schools. Um, and we've developed um, a K-12 school safety and security audit toolkit. And this toolkit helps schools navigate, give guidance on how to audit their schools so they can find where their weaknesses and their strengths are. And we provide a whole list of resources, um, even a very comprehensive um, audit checklist that's intended to be customizable to their district. So it kind of walks them through the different steps. So you're not just looking at the physical security of your environment, you're looking at the culture and climate. You're looking at policies and procedures. You're looking at operations. And so it kind of takes them through the whole processes and sort of what should we be looking at as we're auditing our facilities. And one thing that we always have to educate um, districts on is that you're not just auditing your instructional facilities. You're auditing your non-instructional facilities as well. And so this just kind of gives you an idea of all of the different uh, resources that we provide to schools that they can access um, and download for free. And so going back to prioritizing threats and hazards, um, you want to make sure that you are looking at it from multiple different perspectives. So what is the probability of this happening in our community? What's the magnitude if it does? Are there any warnings? And is there any warning time before something happens? And the duration of the event, and what is the risk of that happening? Whether it's a fire, whether it's a hazmat spill outside of your campus. And this is just another example of a resource we provide schools, it's sort of a checklist so they can determine what's the likelihood of the occurrence, the estimated impact on public health and safety, and the estimated impact on uh, damage to property. And so you kind of have a list of, and many of these don't apply, but it's a, sort of a catch-all for many things that they would want to consider that could impact their community. And of course, you want to develop goals and objectives before, during, and after an incident. So what are you going to do to prevent the incident? <coughs> are we going to engage in drilling, training? What is going to be the courses of action should something like that happen? What do we do? What do we do if there's a fire? Yeah, we know to evacuate, but what other options are there? What does an evacuation um, imply? What are the courses of action associated with that? And then, of course, one of the things that we always have to um, emphasize a little bit more on is how do we get everybody back into the school setting. That continuity of operations is extremely important. And as I just mentioned, you want to identify courses of action. So let's say, for instance, you have a, um, a tanker that crashes outside of the school. There's an unknown substance that's spilling out, and we don't know what it is. What are we going to do in that particular situation? And in most cases, we would shelter in place. And so what are the actions that are associated with that particular predetermined protocol? So what does the notification look like? How do we notify and warn students of this particular situation? Looking at uh, the courses of action when we're providing immediate medical support before we seal rooms. When do we seal the rooms? And when do we turn off HVAC systems? So kind of walking through all of these processes of what are going to be your courses of actions that are associated with these different protocols. And one of the things that um, we often educate districts on is that you may have a whole list of hazards in place, but you're going to have a limited number uh, in terms of protocols and how to respond to many of these situations. And then you got to write your plan, right? you got to put it together. We offer um, sample templates, 
um, uh, on our website that schools and districts can use. Um, so they're not starting from a blank sheet of paper. So they can start from somewhere. They know the certain things that they have to consider in, in their planning process. So you've got to review it, you've got to get it approved, and you've got to share the plan. That's, that's very important. I want to emphasize that. So you can put this amazing plan together. You can have this whole community collaboration. But if nobody knows what the plan is, it's not very useful. And so that's, that's extremely critical here. And I don't mean that means you need to post your plan on your website, because you don't want to do that. You certainly don't want to put your floor plans of your campus on the website. We have seen that. We've made the calls and we've told us to take it down. Um, you don't want to let people know where your evacuation sites are. But you need to share that plan with who is involved in the, the response and the preparedness efforts. And of course, these are some of the basic sections of the plan that we have in place. The basic plan is usually your introductory material, um, your roles and responsibilities, contact list, um, what are your basic uh, procedures for maintenance of the plan. And then we talked a little about, about functional annexes. These are going to be your predetermined uh, response protocols. You know, what are your, your response protocols for notification, whether it's a lockdown drill, if it's an evacuation drill, shelter in place, what's your continuity of operations. And then, of course, in that plan, you're also going to have a list of all of your threats, hazards, and vulnerabilities, and you're going to prioritize all of those. And you want to make sure, again, that they're realistic in nature. I'm a big proponent that one of the most important things schools can do is training and drill. Regular training and drilling increases the likelihood of a well-executed response if an incident does happen. And I can't emphasize that enough when it comes to training and drilling. And um, this is just a, a really big component of all of that. And so when we train and we drill um, to the plan, we're going to have a more effective response. We're going to mitigate the loss of life, depending on the situation. We're going to mitigate the, the uh, damage to property. Those are key things that we want to think about. But I always say you don't want to get caught up in the routine of drilling. So what do, what do we normally think when we have a fire in the campus? We think to evacuate. But what if that fire is right outside the door? What are your other options that are in place? So when we talk to schools about conducting an evacuation drill, if there's a fire, we say, well, yeah, you want to evacuate, but if it's outside the room, we want you to practice an obstructed fire evacuation. Um, what do we think about when we have a danger or an intruder inside our campus? We go on lockdown, right? Lock the door, turn the lights out, out of sight. But what do we do if that door is breached? Now we know in most aperture situations, a locked door is one of the best things we can do. But as Joe mentioned, what do we do if our students are in lunch? What do we do if, during a passing period? What do we do if we're in the bathroom? So. It's really important for schools to think about all of the other options that are in place in terms of response and training and drilling. And I talk a lot about this muscle memory. Um, usually when we have an emergency situation, our natural reaction is to freeze up and we don't know what to do. But if we can train and we can practice all of these different scenarios in our head, we're more likely to execute and be prepared for multiple different options that, that we, we may be confronted with. And so we want to make sure that we, we practice those. And so training and drilling is, is definitely a part of a comprehensive school safety approach. And one of the things that we're going to talk about here in a bit, and Joe's going to talk about, is our standard response protocol that we train schools in um, as a, a multi-based um, course of action. But before I do that, I do want to let you know that we have created a training, drilling, and exercise toolkit for schools. And this is another resource that they could access different um, uh, job aids, samples, tools, um, how to do a tabletop exercise. And you can see one for an explosion, a hazmat spill, um, domestic violence. Uh, one of the things that we often hear from, from educators is that the most common intruder they're going to have on a campus is not an active shooter situation. It's an angry parent in the middle of a custody battle trying to pick up their child. So these are all the other more common things we want schools to, to prepare for. 
um, when they're doing that. And we have guidance on how um, often schools should do their drills. As a best practice and at a minimum standard, we recommend that schools do one of these drills once um, in the spring and once in the fall, with the exception of evacuation drills, which have to be done once a month if you have 10 or more school days. And this is an example of a drill and exercise documentation tool that we provide to districts that allows them to document the types of drills that they're doing, what they tested in terms of their capabilities, and as I've mentioned before, what's extremely critical is lessons learned. It's not enough just to go through the motions of doing a drill, but if you've identified any weaknesses and gaps, this is an opportunity for you to, co to correct those so you have a more effective response going forward. Thank you. Anyone heard of the standard response protocol? <coughs> I know I had some conversations with different folks last night who have heard of it. So the standard response protocol came out of um, Colorado. Uh, John Michael and Ellen Keyes uh, lost their daughter in 2006 at the Black Canyon High School shooting. Um, the last text message she sent to them was, I love you guys. Um, and sad story, I've heard it so many times I've had the pleasure to work with John Michael, but it gets me every time. Um, but what they did is turn that into an opportunity for them to be able to help others, and they, they started this foundation. Um, and what their goals were is, let's have some common language, um, let's create a standard response. Um, but one of the reasons after years of talking with them that we finally adopted it and now um, have resources on our website is John Michael specifically realizes that this is not an entire plan. This is a piece of a plan um, that you should build upon and modify to fit your district. Um, there's no one size fits all. This is a start. So I'm going to just kind of quickly go over um, his action steps. Um, and again, more so in a, we should practice these as a preparedness step, but these also would turn into your response actions if something were to happen. So um, the first one is lockout. So lockout is we have students outside the building. There's some type of threat outside. We need to get students back into the building and <laughs> lock the building. So um, PE is out on the field. Uh, it could be something where there's criminal activity in the area. There's some type of robbery at the corner store. Police are, you know, in the area. And we just want to make sure the students are inside. Everything goes back to normal business as usual once we get everyone inside. Lockdown is what we're going to do uh, when there's a threat in the building. Um, so this is going to be, as Kathy mentioned, lights off, getting out of sight, locking that door. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, we know in all active shooter situations that have happened, no door has ever been fully breached. Um, so it's important to make sure that doors can be locked, um, that we can get folks out of sight, which is difficult sometimes in our classrooms. Uh, the more the newer classrooms that I see being built are all glass. Uh, it's a very collaborative process. So that might be a challenge, but it's something to think about is how can we get people out of sight um, when needed. Evacuate, which is probably the, the most common action that is most intuitive in terms of the language, but this is, you know, your fire drills. Again, as Kathy mentioned, uh, fire code requires the school district to do one fire drill uh, per month for every 10 days of school. That includes summer school. Um, so if, you, if you're running activities on your campuses in the summer, you're expected to do fire drills in those campuses as well. Um, but again, so it's evacuating to a specific designated site. Uh, we're taking attendance, we're making sure that everyone's accounted for, um, and then going from there in terms of um, once we get everyone out of the building, depending on what the situation is, uh, another response may happen. It might be okay, we need to move now everyone to some off site reunification area where we're going to get parents and students back together. Uh, if it's not, you know, a small fire that they can put out, we can get back into the building. Um, shelter is going to be the the, um, the scenario that have to use with the hazmat spill. This is going to be when there's some type of um, hazmat situation where we don't know a certain chemical. We don't know. This is when we're starting to get into safe rooms, areas of the school um, that we can secure completely, whether it's from HVAC, uh, all that. So this is when we're going to shelter. Shelter and lockdown are different. Um, this is more geared towards having that type of incident where we need to fully secure um, an area in the school for students. Come right. Um, separate from, oh, sorry about that, you can still read it, I think. Avoid, deny, defend is not part of SRP. 
Um, but they do work together. This is an example of an addition, a, a different program that can be worked into the standard response protocol. So has anyone heard of the Void and I Defend? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's other versions of it, um, other words, but um, we have gotten re more questions recently about well, how do these work together? Um, and that is a conversation you should have locally with first responders, uh, but Avoid and I Defend is specifically for uh, a man-made active threat. Um, you want to avoid it first, right? If you, can, if you can lock down and get out of sight and, and turn the lights off and secure the room, that's what we want you to do. Um, deny, you know, again, putting stuff in front of that door, whatever it is. Um, deny access to that person from getting into the room. So not only are you now avoiding it by being out of sight, but you're making it difficult for them to get to you. Unfortunately, we have to also consider the last step here, which is you have to be ready to defend yourself. Uh, if someone were to get into that room, um, after you've tried to avoid it, after you've tried to deny access to that room, the unfortunate reality is we need to be prepared to what are we going to do? Uh, is there something I can grab? Is there something? Uh, it's a tough decision. Um, but again, it's a reality that we have to consider um, now. So you can see how this, again, is a separate program, but they work together. These you work into your response protocols in your emergency operations plan. And I would just add to that that this, these processes or these procedures do not happen in order. Mm -hmm. If you're in a situation where the threat is right next to <clears throat> you, probably not going to be able to avoid or deny it. Mm -hmm. So you've got to think about what your other options are. And I just always kind of want to mention that because, you know, it just depends on where you're at in that particular time and situation. Mm -hmm. And so as we, as Kathy mentioned with some of the other processes, you know, again, our main role is how can we support these? We can sit up here and, and, and preach and talk about them all day, but we want to give school districts the tools to be able to adopt these um, and implement these, these practices. So we have a whole toolkit on our website focus on implementing this. And again, we work extensively with, with John Michael and his team. Um, he, again, one of the things that we really appreciate with him is he let us customize this to consider Texas legislation, to consider different um, you know, pieces that are specific to Texas and maybe not a broader version that he's created for the country. So we have a Texas version that takes into consideration a lot of things that we talked about in terms of planning. Um, you know, Again, we, we, we try to make it as easy as possible. So we're giving you guidance for specific drills. We're giving you flyers that you can hand out to parents. Uh, we want to make sure that you're able to communicate um, these different response steps. Um, there's a draft um, poster, there's public address, there's different cards associated with different actions. Um, you know, if you're drilling, we try, it's a whole package that we want to make this as easy as possible. Um, here's one of the posters that you might use. Uh, and again, John Michael is very open to, if you need to change this, if there's something that doesn't, you know, work with another uh, process that your district's doing, call the foundation. He'll give you the rights to it. He'll let you change it, and he'll send it off. And it's all free of charge. Um, they don't charge anything uh, for these materials. But he's very open to, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Here's a start. If you need to modify it, we want you to do that as well. So I'll turn it over to Kathy to finish out uh, with threat assessment. Okay. So as we've kind of talked about, um, preparing to respond uh, effectively to any type of emergency is part of a comprehensive school safety plan. But even more important um, is doing what we can to, well, doing as much as we can to help prevent um, these types of situations or these types of hazards from happening in our school. And so specifically, I want to touch a little on threat assessment in schools, uh, particularly as a method of violence prevention. And um, we do need to know what to do to respond effectively if something happens, without a doubt. We need to know, and we need to be prepared for that. Um, but we also need to invest our efforts toward preventing these acts as much as we can from happening in the first place. And so um, in, in when talking about threat assessment in schools, um, we want to identify those students who pose a risk of, of, of committing an act of violence and identifying appropriate interventions for them. So 
Threat assessment uh, represents another component, um, if you will, of a comprehensive approach to school safety. And it's not a new term. I mean, 20 years ago, the FBI, the Secret Service, and the Department of Ed, um, they recommended a threat assessment approach in schools. And, and since, there's been a lot of research on, on, on looking at evidence-based practices for implementing threat assessment in schools. So what is threat assessment? How many of you are familiar with behavioral threat assessment in schools? By show of hands. So this isn't a foreign concept to you. Um, but basically, it's a violence prevention approach to, one, identify those students who have made a threat of violence, um, assessing the seriousness of the threat, and um, it's about developing intervention plans to assist those students who are in crisis, either at harm to themselves or, or to others. So all threats, I will say this, all threats need to be taken seriously and investigated. And so it's important um, uh, to have policies and procedures in place in, in your school, in your district, and how you're going to deal when you have student threats that take place. And part of those policies and procedures that are district-wide should include who's going to be on that threat assessment team, what types of training requirements they're going to have, and also, you want to have, um, you want to create a, a team that's interdisciplinary in nature, um, an interdisciplinary team of trained professionals, and that could include a mental health professional. You want to include administration. You want to include um, SROs or your local law enforcement. And I, I understand that not every campus has a school psychologist. I understand that. Um, but it's an opportunity to leverage the resources that you have in your local community by reaching out to maybe um, assistance from your education service center that may have those resources or your local mental health authorities. So we want to identify the student who poses a threat, who's made a threat, and we want to assess the credibility of that threat. So we look at threats in terms of are they transient threats, are they substantive threats, and what exactly does that mean? So when we talk about transient threats, we're talking about general expressions of anger, frustration. Um, they're usually temporary feelings. Could be intended as a joke. But the ultimate uh, resolution we, we want to have here is that it can be quickly resolved. So for instance, um, Joe and I are best friends. He makes me really mad one day. <laughs> and um, I tell a friend that, you know, he makes me so mad. I just want to stab him. Teacher overhears me, and um, she takes me aside and wants to, what did you mean by you want to stab Joe? What did he do to make you so mad? You'd be surprised, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, we kind of said, well, you know, he, he made fun of my hat today that I was wearing, made fun of what I was wearing today, and I'm not really mad, I'm not going to stab him. It was just something I said. But when we talk about more serious threats, um, serious intent to harm others, um, the difference between that is, I'm telling a friend, Joe is just spreading really terrible rumors about me. I'm really mad at him, and I want to get back at him. Well, I know that he uh, hangs out by the soccer fields every single day around 3 o'clock well, on Friday. I'm going to end his life. I'm going to shoot him. I know where my parents keep the gun, and I have access to the keys, and I'm going to do it. I tell a friend, post it on social media. It's a little bit different, a <laughs> little bit different. And most students who pose serious threats indicate their intentions either by telling friends, writing it down, drawing, and as we've seen, um, posting it on social media. So this is a little bit of a different situation. You've got more detail about the victim, you've got more planning, you've got more intent. It's all about having more of a plan and more detail in place. <coughs> so. We want to identify the student who poses a threat. We want to assess the credibility of the threat. And we want to avoid two errors when we're conducting assessments. And I always say one is an overreaction and one is an underreaction. So how many of you remember this uh, case in Baltimore? Okay. Well, this young man um, chewed his Pop-Tart into a gun. And he was subsequently suspended. Um, to give it a little bit of context, though, it did happen a few months after the Sandy Hook uh, school shooting. So at that time, a lot of schools were a little anxious about things. Um, probably wasn't the smartest thing to do, but um, certainly suspending him 
probably wasn't the best course of, of action in this particular situation. Probably didn't pose a threat. And then we want to avoid the number two error, which is an underreaction. And as I've talked about, students who, who pose a serious threat tend to indicate their intentions to their peers, to other people, via social media. What have we learned about in many of these active shooter situations? I knew you would have done that. I knew she would have done that. Not surprised. There were risk signs. There were warning signs. There was not much of a shocker that this person did this. And so we want to make sure, if anything, threat assessment provides us or wants us, it's a process for us to be more situationally aware of our surroundings. And I, we heard a lot of this um, after the Parkland School shooting, and I, I talk about this a lot, and it's a very, very simple concept. We hear it over and over. See something, say something. And I always say that, yes, it may sound simple to do, but in many cases, it's a matter of saving lives. So it's about being situationally aware of what's going on. And key to that is empowering our students to speak up and report things when they see that something is off, and not just kind of normalizing those types of, of, of behaviors. So threat assessment is not intended to be an adversarial process. It's not intended to be punitive, although I will say that depending on the situation at hand, it may end up in, in, a, in a punitive outcome for a student. But as I've mentioned, it's intended to identify students that pose credible threats to themselves or others. Um, and it's about providing appropriate uh, interventions to, to manage or, or reduce the threat posed by the student. So there's a bunch of considerations to, to take into account. Um, you know, intervention options can range from immediate to long term, but you do want to consider if the student should remain in school, should they be removed, if and when do we need to involve law enforcement, and um, if and when, what types of mental health and social service or even school-based interventions do we need to provide to that, to that student. And of course, how and when do we notify parents. You know, the ultimate goal here is to assess and, and provide intervention. So if a student is found to pose a threat, a plan needs to be developed, one, to focus on controlling and containing that situation to prevent a possible attack, two, to protect the potential targets of the threat, and to provide support systems to aid in the student who has um, who's posed a risk for violence to help them deal with their, their problems. So again, threat assessment presents uh, another um, mechanism or another component of a comprehensive approach to school safety um, with a primary focus on prevention. And um, to my knowledge, the state of Virginia is the only state in the country that requires threat assessment of teams in, in schools. And so um, we need to uh, get a little bit better at um, uh, working with schools on how to do this piece um, more appropriately. And so one of the things that we're working on at the center is, one, developing a threat assessment uh, toolkit for schools, and also we will be um, providing training and developing training and hopefully um, providing it um, in fiscal year 19 for uh, the next school year to um, provide them with the guidance and, and uh, the tools necessary on how to effectively implement these teams that are based on uh, best practice. So, Joe? We'll I'm going to close it out. Uh, so before I close it out, I want to say thank you to y'all for your attention. I hope you got something um, out of our presentation. But I guess if I can leave you with one thing uh, from the presentation is that we are focused on prevention and preparedness. Um, we think it's a, it's a much more worthwhile investment if we can. Certainly we want to be prepared for response. Um, but if we can invest in prevention, if we can invest in being prepared, hopefully, we don't ever have to use response. Uh, I think you know, law enforcement in school, we don't want to have to you know, initiate some type of response procedure. So that's where we come in, and that, those are the resources that we're trying to focus on. We want to, again, make it as easy as possible. Um, you know, we mentioned the templates and the resources that we provide. Um, you know, we certainly don't want you to just fill in the blanks in the template. You know, we want it to be a very fruitful and in detailed discussion at the community level, uh, but we want to give you a starting point, and so that's, um, certainly the first step of the services that we're able to provide. The second is we provide technical assistance. If you have some strange scenario that's different from the rest that maybe we don't cover in, in some of our guidance, 
um, call us, email us. Uh, we have you know specialists that are on staff that um, can give you very detailed conversation of you know if, if we don't know the answer, we're going to find someone at the education service center or in your local community. Maybe the neighboring district called us. Um, so we're going to try everything we can to either develop the resource on our end for you, um, provide some guidance and conversation, or connect you with partners in your area um, that can help you. So. Uh, again, thank you all. Really appreciate your time. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. Mm -hmm. And I do want to mention that all of our resources and our trainings are free to schools. Um, we do host an annual uh, statewide conference. It's our Texas School Safety Conference. And this year we're doing it a little bit different. We used to have two conferences. We used to have one for school administrators. And we used to have one uh, for school-based law enforcement officers. And so we've uh, uh, taken the approach of, you know, we talk about the whole school community, collaboration, and so we're practicing what we preach. We're wanting to bring both of these populations together, and not just administrators and, and, and SROs specifically, but everybody that's a part of, of school safety and in, in, in the community, coming together, learning together, hearing the same information, learning about the latest best practices. We host that conference um, every summer, um, and this year it will be June 10th through the 14th in Corpus Christi. So, any questions? Yes. I have a question. So, does your organization provide any kind of resources or recommendations for people or for organizations that are wanting to try to help fix some of these issues legislatively? And I'm, I, I work here at SFA, but I know that when the concealed carry laws passed here, those were passed despite protestations from many, many campus law enforcement officials that were saying, we don't want this. Sure. And then the legislature, legislative body decided to do it anyway. So if there are those of us who want to work it from that angle, do you address that at all? Or is it just sort of accepting what's present legislatively and then reacting to it? Because so, I'm interested in the other piece. <laughs> so, um, you know, our stance on this when it comes to implementing um, whatever sort of uh, protocol or procedure or security protocol that schools want to put into place, those are local level decisions. And so um, we don't weigh on it one way or the other. We do get calls from schools saying, hey, we're considering um, possibly looking into arming our teachers. Well, if that's something you're going to do, these are the things that you need to consider. Do you have public community buy-in? Have you talked to parents? Have you talked to the educators on the campus? Um, and and that's, a, that's an important piece is to make sure that everybody's on the same page. But also from our perspective, it's also a response protocol. So if this is something you're going to implement at your district, you need to make sure that your local law enforcement know that this, because that, that could change the response protocol, essentially. Um, I know that we have some law enforcement officers in here. And um, you know, uh, you may have a different perspective on that, but. From our perspective, if this is something you're going to do, it's a local decision. We don't wait in on it one way or another. But these are the considerations that you need to, to you know, take into account. Sir. My concern is for <clears throat> alerted deaf people on whatever campus they are. Yep. For example, SFA has an alert system that it lets me know when an alert is going to happen. Mm -hmm. When the alert actually happens, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. And students in a high school, they may not be with the teacher, for example, the restroom. They could be in the restroom, there's an active alert going on, yep. you can't hear it through the PA. What resources do you have for those sorts of situations? Sure, yeah. I mean, and that, that's, that's where we talk about, um, you know, having a plan and then having a quality plan. Addressing all of those nuanced details are... Um, extremely difficult and challenging. Um, you know, so we've been getting more and more calls from districts of you know, how do we address a certain subgroup of, of students, a certain subpopulation uh, within our campus. The Department of Ed um, and several other federal agencies have put out guidance in terms of best practices. Um, there are certainly tech companies that are now developing resources. Um, but yeah, it is certainly a challenge. Uh, and I know every campus has kind of addressed it uh, a little differently in, in, in terms of um, you know, it, it's, I think the biggest thing we can recommend is having a procedure for it, acknowledging that there's a certain subgroup of population that our general uh, notification system is not going to work for. So what is the plan? Is, is there someone that's going to that room? Is there someone that's going to account for those students um, to make sure that they're also notified and that they can engage in that response action that's most appropriate? I mean, 
mean, if you have a two-story building, a uh, two-story campus, and you have a classroom in which someone, um, I mean, it, it could be someone who has a temporary um, functional or access need, you know, and they're on the second floor, and, and, and they're in a wheelchair, and you, there's a fire, and you have to evacuate, you know, what are your plans? How are you going to get that person downstairs if the elevator is out? So when we talk to school districts, we, we, the biggest step and the first step was getting them to even acknowledge, um, considering those people in your population that have uh, uh, access and, and functional needs that you need to address. So that's, that's, I think we've kind of gotten over that hurdle, but now it's gotten to a point, okay, well, we've identified these folks, so how are you going to, to respond? And how, it may be putting more personnel in that particular area when something happens, you know, um, to, to assist those who can't, who don't have the capability to respond um, as maybe the general population would. Um, you know, schools are mandated to do fire drills on a regular basis. And if I'm not mistaken, their child hasn't died in a school fire since 1958. Correct. So, and we've had 50-some shootings in the last year in schools. When do you think they're going to mandate, require, do mandatory sure. So, shooter drills? Sure. So there's, there's a piece in um, Chapter 37, 108, where they talk about the requirement for an emergency operations plan. And what it does say, and it, it's one of the subsections under 37 one way, um, but what it says is based upon the development of your plan, so the identification of threats, hazards, in your BOP, you're essentially mandating what your drills are. So based upon your threats and hazards, in your plan, uh, in some, our templates allow for that, in your direction and control annex, you're going to say Campus X is going to do a lockdown drill once a, uh, once a semester, and you list that out. You're then now, you know, that, that document then is guiding what drills you should be conducting over that school year. So when we conduct, um, when we collect the results from the audit, uh, we ask, does your EOP mandate these drills? And then we ask, now, do you conduct these drills? Uh, so it's essentially based upon the hazard. All of it stems from the data that you collect, of your threats and your hazards and your vulnerabilities. And then you map that training, drilling, and exercising to those threats and write that into your plan. But I also think that, um, I, and I mentioned this before in the presentation, that you're going to have a lot of different hazards. Mm -hmm. You cannot think of the, the uh, uh, particular response for every single hazard. So that's why the standard response protocol, so an evacuation, you're not going to evacuate maybe just for a fire. You're not going to always go on lockdown just for an active shooter situation. But it's applicable to any type of situation where you have a threat inside the building. So evacuation could apply to, to having to leave the, the campus maybe because there is a uh, power goes out, the AC goes out. So it's not necessarily for, for fire, but that's what our, our, our minds tend to go to. So it's, it's a limited number of, of predetermined response protocols to address a whole variety of hazards. In your, if a school district here in Rural East Texas uh, has an emergency operations management plan, uh, but they're not yet familiar, and their staff and their faculty's not trained in SRP or any other protocol, uh, can you explain to them the resources you have? Uh, and I'm kind of touching upon that you've already trained <coughs> trainers, that there's people with those resources even in this area, even some even in this room that are trained in SRP protocol that can provide services even here in Rural East Texas where maybe we don't have the budgets, maybe we can't send everybody, but we need this in order to uh, to implement SRP into our emergency management plan. Sure. What, what have y'all done to prepare for that? Sure. So, I mean, we realize Texas is a large state, it's diverse, um, so what we try to do is make sure that the materials and guidance we're putting out are through many media. So the toolkit, you can go on, if you want to self-learn, right, you can go on and go through that toolkit and to some degree teach yourself. Um, we also do regional-based training, so we typically partner with an education service center or a school district if the ESC doesn't have space, um, and we're going to go do those types of training. So SRP is one that we rolled out this past fiscal year, and we're also planning to continue next fiscal year, is we're doing six regionally, uh, and we're training trainers. So those folks are then able to go out to their campuses, to their more local areas, um, to be able to spread that training. And we're doing that with some of our other training programs, our law enforcement training program. Um, and then we also do webinars. We realize that you know, not everyone can get to a location, not everyone likes to self-learn. Um, so we do webinars where we walk through some of these processes. 
Uh, and again, the technical assistance is always there. If, if there's a question based upon the presentation where you're like, it's not that way for me, it's a little different, call us. And, and we can have that one-on-one -on -one conversation as well. Okay. We would like to, because of time restraints and we're on a strict uh, time schedule with our summit today, we're going to have to conclude the uh, questioning here. We would like to show our appreciation for you. Yeah. Thank you. Here, and if not, uh, the education panel will be in the main theater at 11 o'clock.